Welcome. I'm glad you're here. You know, we Christians have an interesting belief. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. I've depended on that as we worship together online. I trust that in God's goodness, Christ is present among us and in our life together. And I believe that we can be meaningfully present to one another, even though we can't gather in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings for worship right now. That presence of Christ with us and connecting us to one another is evidence of God's grace and mercy. And I am so thankful for it. I'm also thankful for Kim Wisnia, with a dedicated heart, a brave, adventurous spirit, and a little help from her friends, she offered a remarkable program for us this last week. You'll be seeing and hearing more about it in just a little bit. Perhaps you've heard that we had an incident on campus. A car accident in our parking lot has left us with ele without electricity. We're relieved that no one was hurt, and after some truly heroic efforts, Mike Jacobs and a team of elders have got us on the road to the extensive repairs that will be needed. My thanks to Mike and to Sarah in the church office who have put in so many hours over the past couple weeks, and to all the others who have stepped up to lend a hand. YLPC's partnership with his house has been growing in leaps and bounds over the summer, and so has their work housing people who are homeless. Friday, August 29th, they're hosting Camp Out Under the Stars, and this event has two objectives, to raise awareness about homelessness in Orange County and what it's like to be homeless, and to raise funds to support their efforts. We're invited to displace ourselves in some way for just one night. Some brave souls are planning to sleep in their car. Others might want to stay in their own home, but sleep on the couch or in the guest room. The point is to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, to help foster compassion for those who don't have a safe place to live. That evening at 6 p.m., you'll be able to connect with a live stream with a tour of his house's new home for college students and lots of information about what they're doing to help. You can contribute financially, if you like, directly to his house. Just be sure to make a note that you are part of Team YLPC. You'll be hearing more about this in the weeks to come, but for now, you can click on the links attached to this email to learn more. We have a beautiful worship service prepared for you today, full of some surprises. Shane Hendrickson will be reading scripture and leading us in the Apostles' Creed from Acacia Park in Fullerton, just down the street from where he works. After the sermon, we have a garden tour hosted by Ann Denny, Kathleen Julian, and Dave Wassenauer. It was a big hit at summer arts camp last week, and I know you're gonna love it. I've loved the hymn we're about to sing since I was a child. So I was interested to learn about how it was created. Its author was a parish priest who led a youth choir in the south side of Chicago in the 1960s. He was looking for a song to prepare for some ecumenical interracial events they had planned to participate in, but he couldn't find anything that fit the bill. He wrote this song in just one day, and it quickly became the anthem of the Jesus movement. It sets the stage perfectly for today's worship service.
Good morning, children of God. Our Bible story today talks about how when you are a Christian, you are an important part of the body of Christ. And just as God has arranged all the parts of our wonderful bodies, God also arranges us as parts of his body, God's church. We are each born with different abilities and talents. And when we use our talents, we are like parts of a body, all working together to serve and bless others. And never has the body of Christ been more evident to me than this past few weeks. We have learned to be the body of Christ from a distance. When it was evident that we couldn't do summer arts camp like we used to, we started brainstorming ideas with our CE committee. But it was a long conversation that I had with Carla that helped make our idea for a virtual experience come to life. I had an idea now, but then I struggled with the technology since technology isn't my strong suit. So I reached out to Karen Green and we talked about lots of different ideas until we figured out what would work. Sarah in the office and Aaron Ford helped make those technology pieces work. Michelle made yoga videos, Kathleen and Ann Denny and the Wassenaars shared their gardens with us. Roxanne, Carla and I assembled bags using all of our safety protocols. And then it happened. Many of you joined our virtual classroom. You shared your artwork, your weavings, your thoughts and ideas. You learned new technology and used it well even those of you in your 80s. So today I am grateful for this body of Christ we have here at YLPC. I'm grateful for Lynn and her leadership. And together we can be a blessing to others. And all God's children say, Amen. Listen to the word of the Lord. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectful members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. God of abundant life, your grace is our daily bread. So nourish us by your word and fill us with your spirit so that we may grow in faith and love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Perhaps you've heard this prayer from Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body but yours. 
no hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are the body of Christ. Christ has no body but yours. This poetic prayer captures a fundamental truth about what it means to be a faithful Christian. And it has far-reaching implications for how we relate to Christ and for what it means for us to be the church today. At its very core, our Christian faith is incarnational. It's physical, embodied. We believe that in Jesus Christ, God took on flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus revealed to us who God is, not just by the words that he spoke and what he taught, but in the things he did. He touched those who were suffering and healed them. He broke bread and shared it, filling the hungry bellies of those who followed him. On the cross, he bore our sins in his body so that freed from sin, we might live to righteousness. The body of Christ, his physical presence with his followers on earth is a crucial part of how we know God. After his resurrection, when Jesus ascended into heaven, his body was no longer with the disciples, but he promised the Holy Spirit who would bind believers together in fellowship and mediate the presence of Christ to the church. Christ's body is important to what we believe, but our own bodies also play a key role in how we experience and practice our Christian faith. There are many examples, but let's focus just on worship. To participate in worship is to have an embodied experience. We stand, sit, and fold our hands in prayer. We sing and speak and pray aloud together, exemplifying the faith that unites us by uniting our voices. We gather at the table for communion, tasting and smelling the bread and the juice. We come forward to lay hands on one another in prayer as new leaders promise to serve in ministry. We greet each other, shaking hands and sharing hugs as signs of Christ's peace. And after worship, we maybe shake hands with the pastor and share coffee and donuts on the patio, catching up with each other after a week spent out in the world. All of these embodied parts of our worship are exactly what makes it so difficult for us to figure out how to return to in-person worship in the sanctuary. And it helps us to understand that there is a theological reason why we miss all these things so much. We yearn to practice our faith together in real space, in real time, in real life, with the body of Christ, the fellowship and community of the believers. Christ's body and our bodies. Christ's body, his embodied physical presence with us here on earth is crucial to our faith. And so is our own embodied experience of Christian life. And as it turns out, the two are intimately connected. That's what precisely what Paul was saying in this rhetorical move of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says, you, Paul says to the believers in Corinth and to all Christians, you are the body of Christ. We are Christ's hands, his feet, his eyes. We are the physical manifestation of Christ to one another and to the world. Christ is present virtually through the bodies and actions of his followers. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. We've touched on the Apostle Paul's story several times since Easter, 
He spent the first part of his religious career as a zealous persecutor of Christians. After his dramatic conversion, he was nurtured in the faith by believers in Antioch and Jerusalem, and then sent out as an apostle. His missionary journeys took him far and wide. He would stop by some cities for just a little bit, checking in with them, delivering communications and resources from the larger church family. More often, he would stay in one city for an extended time, two years or more, teaching, preaching, and providing guidance as he gathered a new church community. You can imagine the deep bonds of love and friendship that were formed between Paul and the members of the churches he started. But eventually, his responsibilities as an apostle called him away to serve another church in another city. He missed being with his brothers and sisters in the faith, and they missed him. So he made use of the most relevant form of engagement available to him, the letter. He didn't resign himself to solitude and separation from the Christians he loved, and he didn't wait to offer them his words until he could be with them in person again. He sends them letters, letters meant to be read corporately, perhaps even to lead worship or be a part of it, and such letters allow him to engage personally without being present personally. They are a poor substitute in some ways. In other ways, they are far better. Through his letters, Paul serves as a spiritual guide, teacher, encourager, and corrector to the members of the churches he founded and to Christians around the world for centuries. His letters allowed him to expand his ministry far beyond what would have been possible if he had limited himself only to what he could do in person, face to face. Even in his, its very earliest incarnations, the body of Christ has always been virtual. And now in the digital age, through the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit within and among us, we are able to be present to one another, to offer care, compassion, and love to one another, to do the work of the church together, even when we can't be together face to face. We can be the body of Christ, even when our bodies can't be together. Christ can be virtually present to us today through our connections with other believers. Christians have believed that, depended on it since the very earliest days of the church. So if Christ is virtually present to us through the power of the Holy Spirit, virtually present, but powerfully so, effectively so, if the Apostle Paul can be a real presence to the early churches and to us through the new technology of the letter, then perhaps we can place a little more confidence in the capacity of the new tools available to us to keep us present to one another as the body of Christ. Let me give you some examples of just how effective and meaningful a virtual presence can be and what new opportunities it can open up for our ministry. Since March, our worship has been online on YouTube. When we worshiped in person, we averaged about 115 people a week, which is pretty good, up a bit from a few years before. Now, we regularly get 145 views each week. And if you're sitting next to someone as you watch this, you know sometimes that means more than one person per view. One member shares the service with her sister back east whose home church isn't able to provide online worship. At least two of our members share the service with their parents and then talk about it on the phone when they check in with each other. 
people who are traveling can still be with us. Members who've moved away can check in without the cost of a plane ticket. Even members who work on Sunday mornings can still connect with us in worship. This week's version of Summer Arts Camp raised our technology game to new levels. Many of us had already learned to use Zoom, some like it more than others. Now more of our members have had their first experiences with that new tool and they took to it like ducks to water. We experimented with new tools that allowed us to create short videos, share artwork, and comment on each other's ideas like the string of comments you see on Facebook, all in our private protected network with each other. It was slow going sometimes and took some patience and some assistance, but allowed us to do what we thought wasn't going to be possible, to share the creativity, prayer, and connection of Summer Arts Camp. This year's registration was just about what it had been in years past, and it included participants from the community who aren't members of YLPC. It was wonderful, and it was all virtual. Our prayer chain has been a valuable tool to share joys and concerns of the congregation and enable us to lift one another up to God's care. Because our men's group has been meeting by Zoom, John Barrett was able to join from his room in Germany while he was receiving medical treatment. That actual connection, which happened virtually, never would have been possible before. And it meant so much to all of them. And speaking of the Barretts, those of us who have been following their journey through their Caring Bridge posts have been profoundly impacted by what they've shared there. Caring Bridge helps people facing various medical conditions to post private websites so they can communicate with friends and family efficiently. There's a depth and vulnerability there that would be absolutely exhausting to share again and again and again, one connection at a time. But with CaringBridge, one post can touch hundreds of people the instant it's put up and allow us to suffer with the members of the body who suffer and rejoice with them when they rejoice. Susan shared that with me that the comments that have flowed through Caring Bridge, along with the supportive texts and emails, have been the main way that she's experienced Christ's presence while they've been away from home. And they've allowed us to express our love and care and concern for them, even when they're so far away. These virtual connections allow us to be the body of Christ together. Not only do they help us overcome the limitations necessary because of COVID, they extend the reach of our relationships and our ministry beyond what was possible before. Of course, we can be and still are physically present with one another. I've heard about a handmade card, hand delivered, outdoor chats in the shade, a backyard birthday celebration, families gathering for parallel picnics, meals delivered, plants, succulent cuttings, and produce from gardens shared. In all these ways, and in so many more, Christ is present virtually through the bodies and actions of his followers. Of course, we all long to be together, to be able to lift our voices as one in the sanctuary, to share a buffet meal together on the patio after church. But until we can gather again as we used to, let's make the most of what is available to us. Let's be determined to be Christ's hands and feet, his eyes of compassion in every way that we can, reaching out to share Christ's love to be the presence of Christ to someone who needs it. Because nothing, nothing 
Not a loss of electricity, not even a global pandemic can stop the power of Christ that is at work in us and through us. You are the body of Christ. Amen. The video you're about to see is a garden tour. Anne Denny, Kathleen Julian, and Dave Wassenauer each show you around what they've made and what they've grown. In every case, what they grow doesn't stay inside their fences. Cuttings from Anne and Kathleen's succulents have decorated centerpieces for many a YLPC celebration. They've even found their way to members' homes. Some continue to grow and flourish 10 years later, a living token of a dear friendship. And produce from the Wassenauer's garden has been shared far and wide, as have recipes about how to use up all that zucchini. I hope you enjoy the beauty of what God grows and the loving spirits of these gardeners. and other plants and here are some really pretty little bushes I wish I knew the names of all these plants but I don't and this is a section I just started this a couple months ago it's a lot of shade so I'm trying to find things that go in the shade and here are some of the plants planters that I make sometimes I will give them away or sell them to Charity's Closet. Okay. Hello, welcome to my side yard. This is where I keep all my fairy gardens. My name is Kathleen Julian. And you know what? It's kind of like playing in a dollhouse, but I'm a grown-up. So I play in my garden. This olive tree has been in this pot for 10 years. Carla gave it to me. And look at this little ladybug. The birds think it's real. Here's another one. She's waving to you. I think I have about six fairy gardens. This is a favorite. They're all different. You'll find that uh, all my gardens usually have some sort of a ladybug in them. People think that snail is real, they'll tell me I'll have a snail in my garden. The tools I use to garden are tweezers, a paintbrush, and a spoon. This is my newest one. It has a bridge. It's kind of a fun side feature. This is a very tiny one. I use a lot of succulents in my fairy gardens. They seem to last longer. This one just has one plant, but when you bonsai a plant, it's all about the trunk. Don't you love the gnarls? This one belongs to my oldest daughter because she loves to read books. She actually made the fairy when she was in elementary school. I think Girl Scouts. So I hope you've enjoyed my fairy gardens. It's a beautiful day. I love succulents, so I'm going to highlight a few of them as we walk quickly through the garden. Would you believe this is a succulent? These great big fuzzy leaves. It's called angel's wings. Here's another plant with fuzzy leaves. Teddy bear ear, teddy bear uh, plant. Oops, we're not going inside. Let's go around to the back. I love these great big succulents. They look like one huge flower.
Everybody needs a potting table. People come to my backyard and they say, oh wow, it's not the garden, it's the view. It's what God provided. Gorgeous, isn't it? I love the colors of the succulents. This is fire stick. Look at here, excuse my German, Schwarzkopf means black top. This is called flapjack. Everything has a scientific name, hard to pronounce, and then a easier everyday name. This looks like a clump of grass, but it's really a deadly cactus. Some succulents, they just look like a bouquet. Succulents everywhere. This again, not a clump of grass, it's a succulent. I love the uh, string of pearls. Isn't it fun? It's kind of hard to grow, but it's found a happy spot here. Donkey's tail, an air plant. Here we have Spanish moss. Needs just a little bit of misting. And if you get bored, come jump in my pool. Thank you for sharing my garden. Hi, I'm Dave Wassenaar and welcome to our garden. We're in our backyard in your Belinda and uh, we enjoy our garden. And I just wanted to show you a few things and we'll start here and then we'll end up at our, our vegetable garden. So anyway, I did, I've been working on this for almost 30 years and our, I did have some help from a friend who does landscape architecture on the side and so we laid this out together and this is the result of about 25 years of growing things. So this is probably the newest addition. Decided to put in a um, color um, garden and get some get some brilliant color and this summer it's been very successful as you can see and then we'll just we'll wander here we've got a combination of different layers of things and the trick is to try to get things to bloom and uh, layer uh, at different times of the year so we've got anything from lemon tree to a tangerine tree to avocado trees to bushes and then ground cover underneath so as you can see it's it is layered and it stays green pretty much the, the whole year and so we'll wander over to the vegetable garden and some of you have enjoyed some of the uh, fruits of the garden this year and the veggies so anyway this is where it all started and the big secret of the garden is the soil so as you can see it's dark it's very organic there's a lot of organic material and if i would dig down deep, deeper i would have my show you show off my workers which are the worms they aerate the garden you really never have to turn over the soil um, you keep adding compost and uh, rake it into the soil along with some fertilizer and that helps things grow fantastically anyway um, We've got some artichokes that are left over. They're pretty well done. Um, we've got one zucchini here and uh, tomato bush. And there are more red ones on there, as you can see. And in this plot, we've got more zucchini. I put in two zucchini plants, and we've probably harvested 50 already. And uh, it's August 3, so we got a ways to go. And uh, more, more um, artichokes. We enjoy artichokes in the spring. And uh, kale that's been going since last winter. Pretty, pretty amazing. And a couple more tomato bushes. And then we've got winter squash growing. And uh, last year we got about 50 winter squash. I think we'll probably have about 20 this year. And uh, here's one growing. They're very tasty and orange inside. And we enjoy those, eating those all winter. Um, and then over on this side are our pole beans. 
And uh, this year we did Blue Lake Pole Leans, and I recommend those over Kentucky Wonder. Um, we've, we've had good success with both kinds, but anyway, it's Blue Lake this year. This is a tomatillo that's, a, that's exploded, and if you like the verde sauce on Mexican food, that's, that's where it comes from. And then we'll wander over here to the other side. And on this, on this side we have the herb garden and various kinds of herbs. And then uh, we'll finish here with, uh, this, these are Anaheim chilies. They're the mild chilies and we tend to like the, the um, milder ones. So I'd really recommend that bush has really taken off. And um, the hotter chilies are, are there. But anyway, I'll end with that. Um, thanks for joining us on our tour of our backyard garden area and uh, I hope you uh, get into doing some vegetable gardening and other gardening yourself. California is such a wonderful place, Southern California is such a wonderful place to grow things. So take care and God bless. Please join me in proclaiming the faith that unites us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And as you go, may the gifts of the Holy Spirit be yours. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be yours, and the blessing of God Almighty be yours, now and forever. Amen.